Would you please uh, open your Bibles to chapter uh, to the book of John, please? John 14 and verse 25. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of the world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. The congregation said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Phil. It's great to see everybody today. It was good to have Joshua here last week. It's good to see lots of things that are going on this week. We've had a great week and being able to see some of the things that happen. I know some kids are not excited about school starting, but, uh, well, to tell you the truth, the teachers aren't really either. But it was great to be able to take all the work that you guys had done with the backpacks and with the teacher bags especially and take those to the schools. And you, uh, we'd say, well, we have teacher bags for your teacher. And they go, okay, uh, yeah, sure, come on. And so, but then we start bringing them in and they'd go, oh, oh, wow. <laughs> So that was really nice to see that they were so appreciative because that was so well done and it's because of you guys that you gave so much and that it was just able to be an expression of how we think about it that we want to see people who are doing great things with kids because we do great things with kids and that's part of what it's all about is being able to have that Bible class and have kids learn and it's a great way to have teachers and the community, as well as all the parents, realize that, you know what, churches do something good for them. And so that's been a good thing. And that was very exciting. I think you're going to see some changes by next week. We've been talking building renovation, and so I can't promise. But by the time you come next week, there may be some dust. I'll just leave it at that. How's that? <laughs> I wish I had taken the picture, but that's your backyard in case you didn't know and haven't been out there. And we want to talk a little bit about joy and peace. There's this little church that sits in front of the Superstition Mountains. And a lot of times our life is like that. There's a whole lot of dark clouds around and a whole lot of difficulties in life, but there's one bright spot, and that one bright spot is Jesus Christ. That one bright spot is where church is. And that's the best thing that we're able to see. If you look at the passage that uh, Phil read to us today in John 14, this is the last night of Jesus' life. And when you put it in that kind of a context and realize what he's trying to tell them, they're already upset. They already understand that he's leaving. Even though he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, yeah, but we don't want you to go. It doesn't matter how nice the place is. We don't want you to go. Already Judas has left. He's already with soldiers. Soldiers are already organizing to be able to come and to take him away. And they're sitting in the upper room, and he says, no, I need to tell you about this. And so he says, the, the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit to you. He's going to be a helper, a counselor, a comforter, and it's interpreted that way in different versions that we have. And yes, he is all of those things. And so he is going to be here to help us through this, but especially at that time as they face 
the loss of their leader, they've got to realize that there's something that must happen here. And they realize that Jesus is going away. He says, no, you don't understand. He will be here with you. I am not leaving you alone. He says, and I will leave you my peace. Such an odd statement. Peace be to you. I'll leave you my peace. I give you my peace, not like the world. So what does that mean if it's like the world? Well, if it's like the world, it's, well, fix all my circumstances in my life. Mainly give me lots of money because that seems to be the answer to everything. And what you don't realize is that just creates so many more problems that we just don't even understand. But if you think about it, he says, I'm going to give you my peace. What kind of peace do you have, Jesus? You are less than 24 hours from a cross. What kind of peace do you have, Jesus? He says, I'll give you mine. As he stands in an upper room, realizing one of his disciples is already gone, betrayal is taking place at this very moment. And realizing all of them are going to run away, how do you encourage them? And he says, I'll give you my peace. Hmm. He says, you know I'm going away. You understand I'm going away. You understand what that's all about, and I've been, and I've trained, and we've all done this together, but I'm going to leave you, and I am going to come back. He says, I want you to understand. I'm going to tell you this early so that you'll believe when it happens. And so he tells them about this. He tells them the ruler of the world is coming. He says, we don't have much time to talk because he's literally going to leave there walk down to the Kindred Valley, up the other side of the hill to the Garden of Gethsemane, say his prayers there, and be met by soldiers. We don't have a lot of time. Jesus does what the Father commands so that the world will know that Jesus loves the Father. And Satan is taking advantage of all of this. It is God's plan. You understand it's God's plan. Even if Jesus is going to a cross, it is God's plan, but Satan is taking great advantage of it. You see, someone needs to die in order for us to be forgiven of our sins, and Jesus is that person sent to earth specifically for that task to die, but it didn't have to be a cross. Why couldn't it be easier? Just a bullet something less painful, just a shot. We don't even take criminals and do that to them. Of course, they did back then, I guess, but we don't do that. We're more humane about it. But you see Satan working so much. He says, let me make it the worst possible so that this is how the world would do it because it's his world. And you've got to understand that for you to have peace, you're going to have to have peace in his world. What we really want is for God to change the world into heaven itself and say, let me live in paradise already. He says, no, I want you to learn to have Jesus' peace in the world that is controlled by Satan. So when he talks about peace as one of the Christian qualities that we're to have, it's very, very different, isn't it? The world keeps saying, fix all my problems. Fix my marriage, fix my finances, fix my car, fix what's wrong in my house, fix my job, fix my kids, fix everything around me so that I can be at peace. And as soon as you do that, you'll say something to mess it all up. You just know how it goes. That isn't what peace is about. It's about learning to do to die on a cross, and Satan says, I will use every bit of pain, every bit of control that I have to make that the worst possible thing for you. Satan uses God's plan to create chaos. And Jesus says, do you?
good things that he'd done, and they're the ones who are standing there yelling to crucify him. An innocent man is dying. How could that possibly happen? But he's dying for guilt. He's dying for our guilt. So he must die for the guilty. And we can't really be mad about his death because otherwise we're the ones. We're the ones that's having a problem. And we can't get rid of it. But when the guilt is gone, when he's died for it, it's all over. It's vanished. And Jesus faces the chaos of our world as he faces the cross. But he's been doing it all his life. He's been doing it every single time we see him because he is a man of peace who walks into that world and he sees so much brokenness around it. And it's one of those things that you're able to see how it all happens and you're able to understand, here's what it's all about. The whole Bible is about chaos brought into the world. It started with Adam as chaos was brought into the world. And you're able to see all those things that happen as Adam allowed Satan in and all the rest of us have also so how do you get this piece how do we do this well let me give you some illustrations maybe that'll help a little bit mark chapter 4 i think one of the classic ones is about jesus and the storm it says in verse 35 on that day when evening had come he said to them let us go across to the other side and leaving the crowd they took him with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is one of my favorite stories just because of the power. higher than the boat and the boat's supposed to be a safe place and the boat's not a safe place and the water is breaking over into the boat and the boat is filling up and you can't bail fast enough and you turn around and there's Jesus asleep. Really? He can sleep through all of this and there comes that accusation, don't you care we're about to die? Now, what's happened here? They've got water, they've got wind, they've got boat. They understand all of those. Nothing else has happened. But when the normal things in your life are turned sideways or upside down or whatever else, those are the things that are used against you. And it is those very things that you are familiar with, that you know about, that you understand, all of a sudden, they are not the same at all. I mean, water is supposed to stay in the glass. Water is supposed to stay in the sink. Water is not supposed to pile up 30 feet high. I mean, maybe if you're a surfer, you would like that, but not so much if you're trying to sail across on the Sea of Galilee. And just being able to look at how all this happens, it's, it's all of a sudden the world is upside down. Water is, is high, 
Why is water high? Well, there's wind and it's blowing so hard. Wind's not supposed to blow that hard. Well, there's a boat, but the boat is sinking. The boat is no longer safe. And so all of these things keep going into this and, and they get afraid. And they forgot their faith. It's when the familiar is out of control. It isn't that we're faced with so many different things or terrible things. It's that we're faced with our normal things and they seem to, they seem to create great chaos around us. And when the great chaos comes, our world is turned upside down. And the things that were familiar now seem against us. How can that possibly be? You know, we had these nice little kids. Then they grow up to be teenagers. And you're like, what happened? You have all these great friends. And then you're going, why don't they like me anymore? Happens between husband and wife. How can the person you love the most all of a sudden say they don't even like you? How in the world can these things happen when they take the things that were the most precious to us and they turn them against us? The job that we held, the place, the position, the friends, everything is all of a sudden turned upside down because things are not where they're supposed to be and the world is coming apart and things are just not normal. And what happens is it makes us want to cry, don't you care about me, God, because I am a victim. And as long as you are a victim, you will not find peace. When you choose to become a victim, Satan's got you. Jesus is not a victim. And he speaks into that chaos. And he says, peace be still. This is what it should look like. And it, the wind quits. And the water's flat. And you can bail it out of the boat now. And all of a sudden, everything that you knew has gone back to the way it was. And once again, well, okay, now I have control. So are you still the victim? And what we must understand is that God speaks into our chaos. That the very things that we would hold as most precious are the things that get used against us that we think are so important, that we think are so great, and they get used against us in a way that makes us doubt God and, and question ourselves and able to say, well, here's what's most important. Here's what we're trying to do. And, and all of a sudden, we can't get there, and we don't know how. And Because God says, hey, I'm over here. And we've forgotten about him. And when we decide that, you know, how can my world be turned so far upside down that, that God no longer speaks into it because God's not in the middle of it anymore. But when God's in the middle of it, Jesus speaks into the chaos of our life and our storm, and he says, peace be still. It says, and there was a great calm. And the great calm happens on the inside, not the outside. Many times God does not change the world around us, but he changes the person inside so that he is not a victim. He is a conqueror of God. He is a man of faith. And that is not a victim of circumstance or of Satan, that he could take those things against us and turn our world so crazy. He says, no, not at all. Not going to allow that to happen. So let me illustrate further. If you want to take an ocean cruise, would you book this one? <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> Maybe this one. This is a much better ocean cruise. And we love that. It's great, right? Because it's usually all you can eat. I mean, that's what we like about it, really. Isn't that the truth? I haven't figured that out yet. But anyway, that's one of the things that happens. It's all you can eat, and you can just eat for days and days and days, any time of day or night. It's, it, it, you know, sounds wonderful, right? As long as 
the C stays flat because when C starts bouncing up and down too much, then that's not so much fun. Or when, you know, that disease goes around or when all the toilets don't work then that's not a fun cruise anymore. Why not? You're out on the beautiful ocean in the great sunshine with the waves bouncing everywhere and you just had hot dogs and lobster and hamburgers and everything else and you're like, oh, I shouldn't eat an ice cream. <laughs> it can really get to you and all of a sudden that is not a good, well, it's all that chaos that gets going around, but it's normal things that have just gone crazy on you. Hopefully no water comes into the boat. So how many of you like to ride roller coasters? All right, many are with me. <laughs> Mind you, roller coasters are fine. I love roller coasters, as long as they don't move. <laughs> so this is kind of what I look like riding on a roller coaster. Nancy and I were first dating, and we went to a little tiny theme park, and, you know, the roller coaster was maybe not even as high as this ceiling, and I thought, oh, this will be good. You know, I'm the man, and we get on the roller coaster, and I am white knuckles, and she's just laughing like crazy. <laughs> we're about to die. Don't you understand that? <laughs> ah, she loves it for some reason. They didn't put steering wheels on those. I would be fine if I could steer. You know, it's just the, there's no steering wheel. And so they'll take that and then they start defying all laws of nature and gravity and everything else. And, you know, those are just not good. And so someone actually captured a picture of me. <laughs> this is how I ride roller coasters. Everybody else is having fun, and I'm like, this is fun! <laughs> because all of a sudden, all those things that were so much fun when you were standing still are not so much fun anymore when you're going 199 miles an hour for some reason, and oh, goodness. But we love speed, we love danger, we love excitement, we like the thrill, we don't like crash. And for some reason, I've already crashed, as you can tell. And then I saw this one. Life is a roller coaster. Stop screaming and start enjoying it. Because that's really what it's like. I mean, all of a sudden, everything gets turned upside down in your life, and everything is going to go crazy in your life. And I don't know if I can do that or not, but, boy, that's the task, isn't it? Can you be at peace? Can you find any kind of peace like that And Jesus speaks into that kind of chaos. And there is peace at the center of the storm, even though the waves are all around the lighthouse. The guy in the lighthouse is just fine. And it doesn't matter how bad the waves crash around it. I'm sure the blindness bothered the man who was blind, but it doesn't seem to bother Jesus. He's calm as he speaks into that chaos and heals the blindness. And the lame man or the paralytic is full of chaos because he cannot be normal. He cannot move like other people until Jesus speaks into his chaos and says, get up and walk. The demon-possessed man can't even control himself or what he says or anything about himself. Satan literally has come in and one of his demons has possessed him. And Jesus casts out the demon and brings order to his life. Jesus speaks into the chaos of addiction, of alcohol or drugs or lost control of our life. And he says, peace be still. And he may not change all the things that are going on on the outside. But he does change what's going on inside of us. So that we are not a victim of our circumstance. We are people who stand for God. And he says, peace be still. And he has something for us. My peace I give you. 
Even though he's about to go to a cross, he is not the one in the room who is upset. It is his disciples who are upset. How can you leave us? Because you don't understand what I'm doing. We have a great advantage in being able to understand what Jesus was doing. We would be much more upset if he hadn't done it because we would have to be good enough within ourselves to be able to do everything that is right. And boy, we just don't do that that well. As you look at what Jesus does, he says, I'm going to be with you. I will give you my peace. And I can walk to a cross knowing this is the will of God, knowing this is what God wants, knowing this will save the world, knowing that this is something that will make a difference for all of you. And we do the same thing, right? We see what God's doing in our world. We see that all the chaos is going on around us. And we see that we can live as an example of God and of what God can do in a person's life of how he has power. And if it takes a cross, okay. If it takes a disease, okay. If it takes blindness or lameness, whatever it is, then okay. But God be glorified. And that's really what it's about. And we refuse to be a victim. Because this is where we live. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. And when that Spirit is put into your life, He introduces something that is so different. He produces that peace and joy. I think we could have joy if we could just find the peace. If we knew how to deal with the chaos, we could have the joy. A couple of things I saw. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. And he gives you his spirit to produce that kind of peace and that kind of joy. And he may not calm the circumstance, but he will give you understanding of what it's all about. If you look for him, you're going to see how he is able to use it. And even if he doesn't show you yet, you can have great confidence that he will because it will be there. Here's the other one. Don't let people pull you into their storm. You pull them into your peace. Because there's so many times that people get so upset and so excited around us and they come and they want to share. <sighs> you're going to share your fear and you're going to share your... <sighs> Maybe if I can get you out of all the distress that you're going on, as if somehow that would help. Let me tell you about what I've got. Let me tell you about what God does, and as Christians, if we can really believe what God does, we can face anything with peace. And Jesus looks at a cross and says, I'll give you my peace, because your world is about to be turned upside down when your Savior is crucified and you're going to have to go on your own and you're going to have to be able to do this, but you're going to make it. What an incredible thing it is to realize that we don't have to take on other people's chaos. They can tell us about how terrible it is and about how awful it is and they may even choose to be a victim and say, don't you feel sorry for me. If that's all you want, you're missing a lot. I could give you some peace. I can't take things away and make your life instantly better because you've been at it a long time. And when we've been messing up for a long time, it doesn't just straighten out instantly. But Jesus goes to a cross in order to make peace. Because of the cross, we're forgiven of sins. Because of a cross, we receive his grace. We make a covenant with him when we're baptized into Christ. And all of our sins are taken away. And all of the guilt is gone. And when he says, peace be still, we can depend on that. 
And even though life continues to rage, we can have peace. And he offers us the community of church, and he offers us the forgiveness and redemption to deal with our own shame, and he offers us grace that continues daily, and he offers us his spirit that reminds us every single day, every single time we see the storm, you're okay. You're okay. God has a plan, and you're okay. Speak into the chaos of people around us. And to be able to share with them. He's gone to heaven. And he'll be back. Because he's gone to prepare a place for us. And this is going to be great. Do you have that kind of peace in your life? Boy, God gives it. He wants you to have it. It's kind of, you know, you have to learn. And you have to allow because we'll argue with him, you know, no, fix it first. He says, let me fix you first, and then we'll deal with the rest of this. Maybe you need that kind of peace today. Maybe you need him to speak into your chaos today. Whether you need to be baptized into Christ or just have some prayers about what's going on in your life, I invite you to come while we stand and sing.